out. There we go. It should be recording. Yes. Oh yeah, I just got an email from some from someone saying that they're having difficulty signing. Oh, maybe I sh shouldn't show y'all all that. Maybe not. Put that back. Ooh. Okay, so in, in our little circle, has anybody been working with kids on your computer and then something pops up that you're like, I didn't want that to pop up with my kids. Has that happened to any of you lately? No, but I'm not using Zoom. I'm using uh, Microsoft Meeting through the school through our county. Oh, okay. And how's so that working it, for you? I love it. In fact, when I went to this Zoom, I was like, I don't even know how to do Zoom <laughs> since I don't do it anymore. Um, right. I love it. There's nothing. Well, it's through the county. So, you know, it, it's just, it's very protected. So there's no pop up. Yeah. Um, no, I've had no issues and it's so easy to get set up. Oh, good. They're having no problem. They just click the button and it pops up. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I had someone ask me um, <laughs> if we could use a different platform to do these webinars and we just had to settle on one. And because there's not, you know, we just had to say this is the one we're doing and, and so we just picked zoom and um because you can't do all the platforms for everybody no. so you just have to pick one and go with it but fortunately we are recording these so if somebody couldn't get get on using zoom then you know we do have we do have these recorded and of course um everybody that's coming today we're going to give you i'm going to be emailing you a copy of um, or a link rather to all the digital resources that you're that we're going to have today. So if you see it on the screen, you're going to have access to it. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, so we have 35 so far. That's about a third of who signed up. So we're going to, um, you know, what? I'm going to give it a couple more minutes um, before we start. But um, Anybody doing anything fabulous right now that you're just like, oh, I'm so proud I did this. I've never done something like this before. Anybody want to share out? I did do the lesson that we learned, um, our webinar from last week. Um, I just did it yesterday with my class. Which one was that? The um, economics one with the, um, the small town pizza competition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, the competition. And I even, I even had some of my parents um, joining in, so that oh, was really, fun. Um, yes, that was really good, and we're going to do the Kahoot. Um, I gave them the activity sheets, and we're going to do the Kahoot uh, uh -huh. next week. Oh, to go wonderful. With Yay. <laughs> well, I thank God for y'all, too, Jas yeah, Jasmine. Jasmine, I am so grateful. I am so grateful for what you guys are doing. <laughs> It's one thing to use a lot of technology in your classroom, but it's a whole nother ball game when you're using technology with kids that aren't like right there with you and you're, you're needing to troubleshoot and do things like that. And you just, sorry, baby, I can't be there. I'm trying. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to post this again in here, this link. Um, like I said, it's not a, it's not absolutely necessary that, that you're that you do this but um just so y'all can have the experience the little music do you feel it do you feel the the epicness of what we're going to be doing today yes and we named this the tools of the trade because our focus is going to be on trade and um and and i sent out the email earlier if you got it <coughs> in the interest of full disclosure this was billed as a k5 workshop however um and that might be why we had a drop in numbers um it really is a lot of the a lot of the stuff is real um specifically uh the the images we're going to be looking at or more are more three five however if you are a k to teacher um you can definitely use the strategies that we're going to be talking about uh, that Patty and Marsha are going to be sharing with you um, in your classroom it, in a very, very effective way and not just teaching the econ standards, but also teaching pretty much any of your social studies standards. So um, this is going to be time very well spent for you guys. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is let you do this. Oh, let's look at the agenda for today. 
And um, there's one thing that we are going to skip because I realize that we really don't have a whole, whole lot of time to do it. Um, this is our welcome and our introduction. Hey, I'm Angie Battle. Um, if you've ever experienced the, the wonder that is me, say, hey, hey, wave your hand. Whoa, whoa. Okay, or have I experienced the wonder that is you? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, so I'm Angie Battle. I'm the program manager for Georgia Council on Economic Education. And we are, um, we're only here to help you teach the econ standard. That's our only, only function. That's our only, my only job is to help you guys. So um, then we're, we're about to do a little quick survey. It's just a, um, like how you feel survey. And um, I'm going to just skip the norms part because I think um, we can just, if you have any questions, please put it in the, um, the chat. Um, box and we'll and we'll tend to it there. Um, if it's something that you want to just share only with me, you can definitely email me and I'm going to put my email address real quick in the chat bar. So if you just want to email me personally, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, let me make sure I don't just send it to one person. Um, it's jbattle15 at gsu.edu. Um, I know all of you have already gotten an email from me, but hey, it never hurts to have another look see at it okay um we are going to skip the discussion about the standards addressing trade only because it's going to be embedded in the lessons that we're going to be doing also um just at, at that point we're turning it over to the booth museum um gurus the ladies of booth museum who are beyond fabulous um patty d's and and uh, patty and, and miss marcia um are going to be the ones leading this and the, it it is incredible you're going to get so much out of this um, and then talking about how, then you're going to have a little time to talk about how you're going to use this in the classroom. And then we're going to wrap this up and then we're going to have another survey at the end. Please, please, please hang in tight to the end to do the survey at the end, because this is what I show my boss. Um, and I know, um, I share the feedback you give to my boss to let them know how much you benefit from this. And the more you benefit from this, the more I can do this for you. So yes, do that for me. Uh, so I could do this for you. And then um, I have on there after party, woo woo. Um, so we're gonna, so we've, we've built this for an hour long session. Um, so, but after an hour, um, we're going to just kind of call it a, we're gonna say we're done um, officially after the survey. But if you wanna hang out and um, get more information about uh, Booth Museum and all the things, the wonderful things that they have available there, then um, I invite you to stay around for that. So we're going to keep, keep this band open for a while. Okay, so our next item is our survey. So how comfortable do you feel teaching your grade levels economic standards? Um, do you feel yikes, meh, or yay? And if you're in Nearpod, you can click on that. If you're not, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Oh, I'm going to hide y'all's names. Make that a word. That'll be better. That way you don't have to, you can, you can judge it. You can be honest. And I promise you, you're not offending me. Because if you're meh, we're going to push you to yay. If you're yikes, I'm going to pull you at least meh. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking here and not a whole lot of people are saying um yikes, which is good. Um most people kind of kind of in the middle. Um yep. Oh, let's see what that one person did. Ooh, ooh, that one person had Okay, or or your or your yay. Well, that's good. Okay, so hopefully we we knock you into the yay. And if you're yay, ooh, like woo, let's do this. Oh, I am so so. Well, um, my job is to make get you to feel a little bit more comfortable with it. And um, and if there's anything I can do even beyond this session, um, I'll be glad to do that for you. Okay, uh, moving right along. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to turn everything over to the fine ladies 
um, Mercia and Patty of the Booth Western Art Museum in Cartersville, Georgia. Um, Y'all, I'm just, I'm just gonna shoot straight with you. So I taught in the classroom for 26 years. 22 and a half of those years were spent here in Georgia teaching fourth and fifth grade. In all that time, I did not even know the Booth Museum existed. I'm ashamed of that fact. I'm just telling you, I'm ashamed that I didn't even know about it. But had I known, we would have uh, been there every single year because this place is phenomenal. As a former fourth and fifth grade teacher, I'm just going to tell you this place, it, it's almost like it was built just for fourth and fifth grade teachers and for third grade teachers. I mean, it, 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 it's almost like it was built just for teachers to bring their kids. So I am just super, super excited that they're going to be able to share with you um, more about the museum itself, but also the biggest thing that they're going to share with you are some strategies you can use um, to, to incorporate into your classroom, into your virtual classroom, into your face-to-face -face classroom later um, that will really benefit your kids in teaching them the econ standards. So um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Patty. Patty, I'm going to go ahead and make you the, um, the host with the most. Oh, you doke. You ready? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, do I have to I have to stop share stop yeah share. stop share stop share and then I'm going to there you are and then I'm making you the host so tag you're it <laughs> all right I just saw it that I am now the host all right okay so um, I'm gonna do screen sharing at this point um, so let me go ahead and pull my screen up for you guys you guys seeing that okay yes okay great Wonderful. Okay. Um, uh, we are skipping going through the standards because those are embedded, embedded in the presentation today, but hi, I'm Patty. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here today with the Booth Museum Director of Education. Um, Mersha is going to jump in. Um, she's my phenomenal program manager who's the content specialist and knows curriculum standards um, in and out very well. Um, but just to point out here um, in our program offerings, if you go to our website, you can see that we cite curriculum standards that we support and we definitely have those econ standards in there. Um, with a few more that we need to add to our list after working with Angie, we've realized we meet quite a few more of those. So before we start talking about the econ standards, I wanted to go ahead and introduce you to visual thinking strategies. Now, some, some of you may already be familiar with this, and if not, it's fine. <coughs> A lot of educators that come through our door have never used this before, and then we have some that have used it, and that's great. Um, it's uh, a, a really great strategy that really took off in museums um, in the 90s, and it was developed by a cognitive psychologist and the um, lead educator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, working together and basically it's an inquiry based teaching strategy where you use art to um, to introduce um, cognitive development uh, and it's a great tool that you can use in the classroom and you need very little training to do it but for us as an art museum this is how we introduce all of our programs to our students that come through our doors we have paintings or sculptures or photographs and that's the catalyst for discussion and it always starts with VTS um, it's, uh, as I said, an inquiry based strategy. You can use it for all grade levels. You do not need any special training at all. Um, the goal of it is not to teach the history so much of the work of art, but it's to encourage students to observe the work and then back up their comments and what they, they see or what they think they see with evidence. Okay. So observation, um, citing evidence, um, developing those critical thinking skills as they're kind of putting it all together and then sharing it in the open forum classroom. So how do you do VTS? It's super simple. <coughs> a piece of art, again, it can be a photograph, it can be a sculpture. Um, it needs to be not an abstract work of art, ideally. Then you need to ask students to look at it closely, just observe it silently for a minute or two. And for them, that'll seem like forever, but they're really looking at all the details in that piece of artwork. And in their mind, they're starting to make connections and figure out what's going on. So then you ask three questions to guide the discussion. What's going on here? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can, can you find? Easy peasy. You are not correcting them. You are simply 
rephrasing, paraphrasing the student's answer. What's going on here? Oh, I see a dog in the painting. Okay, you see a dog in the painting. Another student's hand will go up. Okay, but he's on a boat. Okay, well, so you see a dog in the painting and you see that the dog is on the boat. They start making, and you build those connections and it's brilliant to see it happening because they start to go into more and more level, um, depth level with their observations. And you help to um, steer that by asking that second follow-up question, what do you see that makes you say that? So you want that evidence. How, you know, tell me in the painting, what do you see? Again, you're just paraphrasing the students. And then what more can we find to push them even further? Everyone in the classroom jumps in. You're not telling them that they're right or wrong. So it's a really freeing experience for many students. Um, not that you guys are sitting there telling your students that they're wrong all the time. I know you're not, you're not doing that. But um, it's a great way to kind of um, equal the playing field. And it's, um, it's a, for me, I think it makes, um, not only makes art accessible, but it can make um, just lessons in general, interdisciplinary lessons accessible to all students in your classroom because it is simply based on observation um, and what they are seeing. So it's great in that sense. Um, it supports critical thinking skills and all of this um, transfers over to other subject areas. So um, you can use VTS uh, with object-based learning, um, which is more of a um, historical focus, but we use that with our artifacts instead of just two-dimensional paintings or sculptures, you can use it in um, science, you can use it uh, really in a lot of disciplines. But today, I'm gonna turn it over to Merja, where she's gonna lead you through a mini VTS uh, at the beginning with our artwork and in leading uh, into teaching economics through that, but the painting is the catalyst. So I'm gonna go ahead and let me take us down to our next slide and I'll turn it over to Merja to start with this piece of art. Thank you, Patty. So I'm Merja Martin. I am a programs manager at the Booth Western Art Museum specializing in content. So my job is to write the content for all of our school programs that are coming into the building and aligning it to Georgia standards. And we have been able to find that our programs can be very interdisciplinary. So we're obviously, we hit a lot of social studies standards, visual arts standards, but we also hit ELA standards. We hit some science standards, geography standards, and in this case, economic standards. So we're hoping to show you uh, through, by kind of doing a mini walkthrough of one of our programs, how we cover some of those economic standards today. So I want you to pay attention to the piece of art that Patty has put up on your screen. And I'm not gonna tell you the title of this painting quite yet. I want us to use our VTS or visual thinking strategy to really kind of look at this painting and try to figure out what's going on here. So the way I want you to do that is I want you to um, consider the questions that I'm asking and type your answers into the chat channel. And Patty is gonna help me moderate and she's gonna help me uh, figure out um, and, and point out some of those uh, questions that you guys have. So uh, the first thing that we ask is what is going on here? So what do you think is going on here? Feel free to type that in the chat window. Really uh, would you like us to speak it or type it? Type it, please. Yeah, type it, please. I think we're just trying to keep from kind of overwhelming since there's so many of us participating today. Yes, if you'll type it, um, either either Patty or I will call it out. Yeah, and I see we are getting some in a negotiation, trading, colonists arriving in a new era. I think they're trading or bartering, land declaration. Fantastic um, answer. Fantastic. You're and, um, and, and since we're getting so many answers, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next question. I mean, ideally, you know, we would be really analyzing this work of art, but I'm going to kind of, you know, we, we're on a time limit today. So what do we see that makes you say that? So if you're saying, you know, they're trading, bartering, give me a reason why you're saying that. What about this painting is communicating that this is happening to you? So you're asking what evidence, what do they, what details from the painting do they see? Yeah, yeah. Look like someone um, trading? Well, yeah, well, what do we see that makes us say that? You know, exactly yeah. how this lays it out, you know, what are you seeing that is communicating that to you? Body language with hands, I'm seeing that come in on the text box. Um, body language, okay. goods, the flag on the boat, weapons. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, I'm you guys are 
faces, their emotions, their body language. I'm so glad y'all are picking up on that because I mean that is very evident and especially you know obviously in person this painting is much larger than the screens we have this on but it's so evident especially seeing this in person that body language how that's being communicated so I like that you're picking it up on their faces hands you're seeing the goods American flags boat and weapons see I, and, and just you know I can only see little pop-ups of the chat I don't have the full window mm -hmm. having Patty help me uh, uh, moderate but okay. the boats and the weapons to Mersia looks like people are being stopped from walking too far mm -hmm. okay so excellent observation so the weapons the boats you guys picked up on goods you picked up on the flags um, so I'm gonna move on to what more can we find which I think you guys are already doing you guys are already kind of really looking in depth to what you see here intensity of facial expressions intensity oh i'm so glad you guys can see that detail on the screen i'm looking at my phone so to me it looks really tiny <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm not seeing anything else right now coming in the chat window and it may just be my connection may be lagging well i'm going to go ahead and move on to the historical significance and that's how we use vts at the booth we start off using those visual thinking strategy skills and then we build on it with um, the historical background behind the artwork. Um, so that way that's building a discussion with our students and our guests, um, like Patty said, kind of reinforcing what they're seeing and it's using art as a catalyst for the historical discussion to follow. So, so this painting is titled Encounter with the Teton Sioux. It's by Robert Pummel. And this is the core of discovery with Lewis and Clark meeting the Teton Sioux and making first contact with them off of the Missouri River. Um, and as many of you read, this painting is depicting a very tense situation. Um, you guys were picking up on that body language. You may have noticed that we have, um, we have William Clark here in the center. He has chief partisan standing in front of him and he has his sword drawn. So that communicates that there's a lot of tension going on in this painting, right? Um, a lot of people also picked up on the other weapons that you see around them. We see um, some warriors who are holding guns, some Teton Sioux warriors who are holding uh, spears and bows and arrows. And um, you can even see some uh, members of the Corps of Discovery standing in front of the flag and they've got their guns raised. So that communicates that we've got a tense situation. And what is going on here is this is actually a trade disagreement. Uh, what happened was, um, I see someone just said lack of communication, I think, and mm -hmm. I love yep. that on that because this was before Sacagawea and Toussaint Charbonneau joined the Corps of Discovery to help Lewis and Clark with their um, interpretation. So Lewis and Clark, they had a member of the Corps of Discovery who was like, oh, I know a little bit of Sioux. And uh, that unfortunately was not enough to do these negotiations with these three chieftains of the Teton Sioux. Uh, the Teton Sioux thought that they were gonna be getting more in trade uh, when they realized they were not. Um, they also thought they might be getting that boat in the background that many of you picked up on, the pirogue, and a disagreement ensued. Um, they actually went out on the boat. We think that's part of why they thought maybe they were getting the boat, and they demanded to be back, taken back to shore when they realized that wasn't happening. Uh, Chief Partisan, standing in front of William Clark, actually got so upset he pushed him, and that caused William Clark to draw his sword. Now again, this is a big miscommunication and misunderstanding. Trade actually helped resolve this situation, though, because by trading more goods with the Teton Sioux, the Teton Sioux realized that they did have friendly intentions. We can see other evidence of trade in this painting. We have the gentleman who has his arms raised. That's Black Buffalo. And he has on a nice coat, a nice jacket and hat that was traded to him by the Corps of Discovery. And hopefully for those of you who have bigger screens than mine, you can see that there's also a medallion on his chest and that is a peace medal. Um, that was common for explorers during westward expansion to give to leaders of various tribes um, as a sign of peace and also in hopes that they would trade with them. Um, Black Buffalo helped calm this situation by raising his hands and said, hey, we all need to calm down. And that's when they traded a little bit more with each other and were able to, uh, uh, to, to calm down the situation. And they actually ended up staying with the Teton Sioux for a couple days for a peaceful resolution. So this is, um, this is one of our favorite pieces to point out uh, to students um, with Westford Ho. And are we moving on to the next slide? Okay. 
All right. And um, all right, so here we have, and uh, I guess I'll save the title again. What's going on here? And what do we see that makes us say that? So again, if you'll put your observations into the chat window and Patty can help moderate, Patty and Angie can help me moderate that. And just a reminder, this is also on your Nearpod, if you uh, joined uh, in the Nearpod session, um, it's also on your Nearpod screen as well. Okay, I'm just waiting for um, stuff to come in through the chat window. And you know, with this particular painting, there's less of a... Um, there's less of a narrative going on. So you can also type in just your observations of what you're seeing with this painting too. That's acceptable as well. He's a trapper, maybe a fur trapper, a gentleman who's reached a peak during a journey, traveling and is now, now tired from his travel, um, going a long distance through mountains, hunting with a gun, vast exploration. And remember to tell me what, what you're seeing that's making you say that too. So we have, um, this is really rough terrain. It is, Gentleman yeah. That is traveling. I think we're, we're getting it in. It's just, there's a little bit of lag with that second question with the chat window. Well, and, and here's a, uh, throwing out this question. What makes it, what makes you say it's rough terrain? What would make, what are the, what do you see? What do you see in the painting that makes you, yeah, that makes you say it's rough terrain? Like oh, Angie's saying. All right. Um, he is some type of traveler because the horse, um, down the, horse rocks. the pack on the donkey. Mm -hmm. He has uh, extra mule with supplies. Um, Good mountains look that. like they are made of stone and snow and a little greenery. High altitude. Rocky Mountains possibly have a higher altitude. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're getting some excellent observations. And so you, I mean, you, you guys are great. You're doing great with your observation because we see very rocky mountains in the background, large boulders. Um, you're picking up on the horse so you know that he's traveling. Um, and you also see the, the mule in the background, which of course mules are also wonderful for rocky terrain uh, because they can, they have steadier footing than even a horse does. Um, and he's carrying something on his back. Um, and how many of you, I hope you picked up on the clothing that he's wearing as well. Um, and so a lot of you are deducing uh, that he might be a fur trapper. And I think we kind of went into that third question too, with some of our observations, what more we can find. Um, so that's why I'm kind of moving on a little bit. Um, and uh, I think I- oh, I'm sorry. I just think it's interesting that somebody said he looks like a miner. Oh, a miner. Oh, okay. So miner I mean- or fur trapper. We're picking up how he's a little disheveled, I think, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's and he's got up. gray in his beard, so he's older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, and, and he's got a long beard, too, so he's not very concerned with keeping himself clean-shaven, right? Um, so definitely um, somebody who, you know, is used to roughing it a little bit. I think also if you look at his clothing, you can see that this is not typical for this time period, um, American uh, fashion. Uh, this is clothing that he has probably traded or gotten with um, Native Americans that he has been trading with because this is a painting of a fur trader. It's called Man of the Mountain by John Scott. And his clothing is something that he would have possibly traded. Um, he could also have a relationship um, with a tribe or a, um, a, a woman or person from that tribe who could have made him this clothing. Um, and it's much better suited to outdoor lifestyles than, um, you know, your typical uh, slacks and shirt, your cotton shirt, uh, much more weatherproof. And of course, the fur traders were very um, interdependent with Native Americans in their trade practices. Uh, because for a fur trader, they had the price incentive of specializing in these furs uh, these furs were at such a high price when they sold them to the fur companies on the East Coast that they were willing to go out into this wilderness by themselves and trap and hunt for furs. But the way to get the most furs was through voluntary exchange with Native American uh, tribes that they would have had contact with along the way. Um, so there were lots of different things that they might want to trade. Uh, but a lot of times what they were trading to these Native American tribes were things that were um, rather modern conveniences for these tribes and things that were highly desired. Uh, the tribes had the specialization in hunting and gathering these furs and, uh, and were able to give large quantities for the items that they were trading. 
Marcia, I, I have the items up on the screen. Can you see them? I can. And so if you guys see in the top right corner, if you want to click on that, that's what I had to do. Patty has her document camera with some items up that uh, we show children and guests who are visiting to illustrate some of the trade items that might be going back and forth between our fur traders and various um, American Indian tribes. So Patty is holding right now a piece of hide, it's tanned hide, and she also has a bone awl, A-W-L, in her hand. And that is a sewing tool, similar to a needle, and it's got a very pointed tip. We actually have to be careful, we don't pass it around to our students when we let them look at it. And she's going to demonstrate for you how um, Native Americans would sew this hide. So you would take a bone owl, stick it in, create a hole, just like Patty's doing. And then to sew, you would actually take a piece of sinew there in the center. And sinew, it's just a tendon that has been dried, in this case, from a buffalo. And you can see it's very stringy when it's been dried. And it's perfect consistency for thread. And it's very durable. So you would take your piece of sinew, it's a little stiff, and you can use that to sew through the holes of the hide with. Now, as you can imagine, that's very labor intensive. Not only do you have to tan the hide, you have to poke the holes with the bone awl, you have to uh, take little pieces of sinew and continuously sew with it. So while it's very durable, it's not very, it's very time consuming. So Patty is holding a piece of calico cloth right there. So this is one of those modern conveniences that Native Americans were willing to trade a lot to obtain. So calico cloth, um, of course, it's got a beautiful pattern, but it's also lightweight. It's easy to work with. We don't have to worry about tanning it. Um, she also has a um, metal needle. So, and this really helps with that sewing process because it's kind of the two in one of the bone awl and the sinew that they were using to sew with. You know, if you have cotton thread that's seemingly endless compared to those little pieces of sinew, it's much easier to work with and create uh, lasting clothing. So those are just a few of the items and we've got a few more I think we're gonna show you. Oh, so we've got our beaver furs there. So of course, this is what the mountain men really want when they're trading. So we have a beaver fur during the 1830s that was especially in high demand. A pound of beaver fur could go for about $5.99 a pound, which with inflation, that would translate into about $184 today. Wow. So you can see that beautiful beaver fur and Patty is showing you how lush and thick it is. It's naturally waterproof as well. And Patty, hold on, I'm having trouble seeing your document camera. Oh, there we are. And Patty is also holding up a piece of rabbit fur. So we'll show both of these to students. We'll let them hold it. And you know, sometimes they're like, oh, is this real? And they're a little shocked by that. Um, but you know, it also shows how the different furs were good for different items. So that beaver fur would be much better for um, using to make beaver felt hats, which are what was so popular in Europe uh, that the fur companies were selling to Britain and the rabbit fur is nice and soft. So Patty's also putting up other items that were in high demand for trade. That includes a cast iron skillet that we see here. A cast iron skillet or a cast iron pot, of course, is very valuable to a mountain man who is traveling across the country, but also to Native Americans especially Plains Indians who had nomadic societies. Um, if you are constantly tearing down camp and moving, you're having to worry about bringing cooking stones or ceramic pottery with you. That's not very durable for travel. Uh, something like a cast iron skillet, you can put on a saddle and not worry about it getting broken or being too heavy and coming with you. And also it, it gives you needed iron in your diet. We also have to the right, some yellow seed beads, little glass beads, um, and it's on something called a bead hank. And these beads were highly desirable uh, to Native Americans. Um, a lot of times today, if we think of traditional Native American clothing, we might think of a beaded pattern on that clothing. That actually was introduced by the, the mountain men and the fur traders. So they were buying these glass beads from Europe. They were manufactured in Czechoslovakia and Italy, and they were selling them to um, or trading them with the Native Americans. The Native Americans prior to this would use uh, bone, shell, and porcupine quills to decorate their clothing very beautifully 
but again, very time consuming. Glass beads save time. They're also very durable and colorful. Let's see, and so something else to consider also when you're thinking about trade is the opportunity costs that come with trade. So an opportunity cost is something that you are sacrificing when you make a choice. So if you are trading and you decide to go with those beautiful glass beads, but you really need an iron skillet, you're missing out on that iron skillet and that needed iron in your diet. Okay. So also in demand during this time would be bison fur, raccoon fur. I'm sorry, Patty, I see you putting something up. That's all right. Did you want to go over this now? Oh yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so these are some of, well, no, let's go back to the cards, Patty. I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. I jumped ahead. No problem. I got excited about buffalo fur. It's exciting. It's exciting stuff. <laughs> exciting to us for sure. It, I know, we're very excited by it. Okay, so we have our trading game and I'm going back. All right, so if you see our slideshow, you see an example of our trading game from our Westward Host program. So Patty is holding up a prompt card. So our students sit um, on the floor, they have two teams, mountain men and American Indians, and they are trading with each other in voluntary exchange. So you can see we have the two different types of cards and these are just trading prompt cards. So they roll the dice, depending on the number they get, in this case, number one, they have trading prompts that help them make their trades. So in this case, the mountain men can make their own trade, Sometimes we have to remind students that in voluntary exchange, everybody wins, you know, uh, so everyone has to agree <laughs> on their trade. Our Native Americans, just for this particular number, they are encouraged to trade 10 otter pelts for two bead hanks. And I think Patty has those cards already on her document camera. So we see 10 otter pelts and two bead hanks. Um, and so a lot of times students will begin to pick up, they'll say, hey, the Native Americans are trading an awfully lot and they're getting two little bead hanks in exchange. And again, we talk about those modern conveniences and how the items that they were trading for were in high demand. Um, they really wanted those bead hanks or those cast iron skillets or gunpowder or bullets uh, that really brought a lot of convenience to their lives. Here's another trading prompt. So trade two horse, two, oops, two knives for one horse and six pounds of tobacco. And the kids really, when they start trading horses, they really pick up on how big some of the items they are trading for small things in exchange. Uh, so two knives, they're two metal knives compared to bone tools or stone tools, of course, are so much more convenient if you are somebody who is trying to cook, you know, dinner and trying to carve up a piece of meat. So those two knives are something that you would trade a horse or large amounts of fur for. Okay, and so we're moving down on our slide. If, you, if you're um, looking at that, uh, you will see um, this is Cassie. She is one of our museum educators in front of a painting by indigenous artist, Alan Hauser. Um, and that is depicting a buffalo hunt. He is a Chiricahua Apache um, indigenous member and uh, is, is famous for these beautiful illustrations. And Cassie is showing off our buffalo box. So that is actually a buffalo box that has been made um, in traditional style using every part of the buffalo. And Patty, I think we have some stuff to, to show with that. Yep, it just takes a second for the camera to switch over to the new image. And now we get to look at buffalo hides. <laughs> So we have uh, two different types of hide in front of us. We, Patty is holding up a piece of untanned hide. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate how it's, it's rather stiff and she can knock on it. If, you're in, if, if you were to hear that in person, you would hear a knocking sound. Um, it's not very flexible. There's a little bit of a bend to it, but it's not super flexible. Um, it's a rather stiff material. So that is a wonderful material for making um, for using on the bottom of moccasins, but also our buffalo box is actually made out of that. So you could make boxes out of this material uh, to store items. This has had the fur stripped off. I think Patty's about to show another piece of hide. That is a tanned piece of hide. So this still has the fur attached. On the other side, you can see it's much softer. And Patty, I think she, yeah, she can even roll it up. So that has been tanned through a chemical process using another part of the buffalo. Uh, they have used buffalo brains to tan this hide. So that actually takes the brain, mashes it up, spreads it on the hide, 
um, and then scrapes it off washes it and you have a nice tanned soft piece of leather you can use that leather to create clothing um, you could leave the fur on it and a nice big buffalo fur would act as a a robe a coat um, or a large blanket and they're extremely warm in the winter time and then we've also got a buffalo horn that's something else that we like to show in our buffalo box um, and kids have a fun time guessing what this might be used for. If you were, if, if you were on a tour with me, I would be asking you what these individual items might be used for. And a lot of times kids guess a musical instrument, but actually it was used for a cup. So you could drink liquid out of this. You could use it as a grain scoop. You could also carve it and make other tools out of it like spoons. So very useful. And again, illustrating how every single part of the buffalo was used. Um, and this is a crowd favorite. <laughs> um, again, normally I would be asking, what do you think this is made of? And it is an organ of the buffalo. It is a buffalo bladder. Uh, so this bladder uh, would um, be taken and dried and used as a water bottle. Um, a lot of times the kids start going, ew, <laughs> when you tell them this. Uh, but I've actually had a nurse come along on our tour programs before, and she assured us that the organ itself is um, quite sterile. Uh, it's what is held inside that is not so sterile, but when it's cleaned and drained, um, it's actually perfectly safe to use for something else. So they would fill it up with water. If you're someone who is hunting or exploring, this is going to be super important to you because you wanna stay hydrated. Okay. It's like their version of the Hydro Flask. You know, you got you got to stay hydrated, right? <laughs> right. You can't take a big ceramic jar of water with you oh. on your horse. When you're traveling. No. All right. So back to our slideshow. So let's go back to using some of our VTS skills, and then I will tell you the title of this painting, what is going on here, and what do we see that makes us say that. And again, remember to type your questions. Patty and Angie are helping me moderate. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've got the chat window open. Is this the one with the hill, right? Yes. Okay, got it. Just want to make sure I have the right one up on the near pond. Got our first observation. <laughs> yes, there's a hill. There's a hill. <laughs> yeah, they just got through eating their chow, chow time. Look at them using the term chow. I know. A man is pointing. I saw some wrestlers. And Looks like there are several men going somewhere and maybe they found what they're looking for. Looks like they're relocating. There's a wagon and multiple cowboys. So it sounds like people are picking up on that movement. We see cowboys, we see a chuck wagon. Um, somebody knows the man at the top who's pointing. So excellent observations. Um, I think, like I said, from the movement, from the horses, you can tell they're about to travel. And what more can we Find. Let's go ahead and throw that third question in there. Um, moving a herd or wagon train of settlers, maybe. La um, cowboys, chuck wagon, either they are preparing to travel or just returning. There's a man standing next to the wagon, looks confused, maybe. Oh, yeah, man standing next to the wagon, good observation. Yeah, because he's, mm -hmm. he's in the background. That wagon's more in the background, so good observation. And that man in the background looks like he's got a white cloth. Like yeah, someone said that's the cook, um, right, Angie? It looks kind of like an apron, mm -hmm. but but we don't we're not sure. Yeah, and that was just what someone thinks. She thinks that's the cook, and the the um, evidence to back that up would be like Angie said, the white apron on the um, on the person. Exactly. Horse with the head down looks like he's trying to buck his rider. Ooh. I would like to joke with the kids. Maybe that's a new cowboy. Maybe he doesn't know his horse very well yet. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, excellent observation. So I'm going to move on to the historical significance. Again, we would love to spend more time pointing out all those details because kids especially, you know, they're so observant. So they really go into depth with this in analysis and, and we always love to have those discussions. This is called Starting the Big Circle with Charlie Dye and these are cowboys on a cattle trail. And you guys, a lot of you picked up on that. You picked up on that they're traveling. A lot of you picked up on the chuck wagon in the back. And the man standing next to that chug wagon is Cookie. So he is the cook for the company. He's kind of like the second in command. Um, definitely the person whose good side you want to stay on because not only does he feed you, he also often carries the gold to pay the cowboys at the end of the trail. 
And what they're doing is they have woken up. It is morning time. They probably have gotten done eating breakfast. I saw some people say that they've gotten done eating. Um, and they are actually going out to figure out where their herd uh, uh, kind of migrated to in the night. Because at nighttime, you really can only spare a couple cowboys to keep an eye on the cattle in shifts um, and uh, you know to protect them from coyotes and cattle rustlers. But in the daytime, you have to get them back on the trail. So the rest of the cowboys are going to round up that big herd of cattle, move them down the trail, and they're doing this by spreading out, looking for the cows. They usually don't have to look far because usually those cows are by a body of water or a big pasture land. And so the demand, uh, demand for beef, Mersha, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So after the Civil War, demand for beef um, had skyrocketed, meaning the price was also um, uh, quite high on cattle. Uh, so that's what led to these cattle drives in the first place. Also at this time, a lot of soldiers and men were out of work after the Civil War. So um, these ranches had been growing in size during the Civil War, so they had the need for the cowboys. They had the money from the, the high price of beef to pay those cowboys well, and so there was a lot of incentive for those cowboys to go out on these trails and participate in three weeks to three months long journeys, bringing these cattle up the trails to major cities to sell them. And I think we have another slide that, sh that illustrates how they would travel with these cattle up the trail. We sure do. There we go. And that's, that's a wonderful over. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to just say while you're shifting over, um, someone had asked if you can um, have the text, uh, uh, the con, the text of what's actually the story that's going on in the along with it, like after they've done the BTS, then provide them with a reading. Of it. Oh, I so like maybe provide a reading to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And I would love any suggestions that you have for online teacher resources, because that's something we're really working to build this summer. And so we're trying to, to get um, ideas from teachers on what they would like to see for resources online. So absolutely send those to us in chat as, as you think of them. I would appreciate that. So we see cowboys in formation around their herd in various positions. We see at the very front the trail boss. Uh, in the painting, the guy who was pointing, that was the trail boss. So the trail boss is the manager of the whole operation, and he's the one who knows the trails the best. He's done it a hundred times, probably knows the trails like the back of his hand, and he's also in charge of all the cowboys and making sure the cattle get to um, the city safely. Uh, and he gets paid very handsomely for his job. He gets paid about $125 a month. Um, and the person who gets paid the most after him would be Cookie. So Cookie in the check wagon, again, has a very important job because he's overseeing the health of all the cowboys on the trail. Not only is he a cook, but he's also a doctor. Uh, he also holds the gold that would pay the cowboys at the end of the trail. Um, and so he gets paid about $60 a month. He gets paid pretty handsomely for a cowboy. The rest of the cowboys that we see in various positions, there would be various price points for them uh, for employment, but we're looking at about a dollar a day for the average cowboy. The one who would probably get paid the least would be that poor wrangler up at the top. That's usually a very young and inexperienced cowboy who's getting experience and he's in charge of wrangling the horses that are needed to uh, bring the cow cattle along the cattle drive. Once they get to the big city, the cattle sell for about $50 a head. Um, and if they make a great profit, a lot of times those cowboys get a little bit of a bonus on top of their salary. And I did want to mention that this was drawn by um, our, our resident artist and Western historian Jim Dunham. He does these cute little illustrations for us. Marcia, there's an interesting comment in the chat window. It says, because um, we do discuss this with our students during our um, our tour when we ever when we do this program it says advent of the railroad made it easier to take cows to market in long distances mm -hmm. exactly we like to talk about how that in some ways was almost the end of the cattle drive that and barbed wire uh because you know with the railroad you don't need all those cat those cowboys to to round up the cattle and put them on the train you still need some some cowboys but you don't need quite that number so it was kind of um the beginning of the end for trail life as we know it so good point very good point and that's a great way to make your lesson interdisciplinary you know you can add that technology to your lesson you know we've, we've already got the economics and we've already got the social studies and we also have some ELA standards in there too, because we're drawing inferences from 
these paintings and artworks that we're looking at. So we've already got an interdisciplinary lesson here. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's got it all. <laughs> it's all there. We're going to move on to the next slide. Are you ready for that, Mersha? Absolutely. So I think, uh, Patty, you're going to join in with me a little mm -hmm. bit right? um, yeah. because talking about how you can uh, use some of these ideas in your classroom. That's right. So what we have here, we have two um, images, the trading game, which we discussed. We talked about all the um, economic standards supported by this um, with voluntary trade and opportunity costs and um, with the bison box, which you see here on the left, I showed you items from that earlier. Um, with the bison box, uh, this is a great way to, for a third grade to talk about um, natural resources and the, uh, the interdependency of the lifestyle of the indigenous peoples of the America with um, our Native Americans or American Indians um, and their reliance on natural resources. Um, and then what happened uh, with westward expansion once the bison were hunted to near extinction. So there's a lot you could do with this, but the bison box is a great touch experience. If you wanna engage different learning styles, with art you're engaging um, a lot of the visual, visual learners. And most of us are visual learners. I think that's the great majority of us, but not all of us are. But um, th we also, with the touch boxes, can engage different senses, the sense of touch and even the sense of smell. Um, and you could even have an auditory you know, response depending on what you have in the box. But the boxes can be made really simply. This is something you could do in your classroom. Um, the box could be made out of a Kleenex box or a shoe box or all those Amazon boxes that we have laying around the, the house right now, right? And you can decide um, how you want to, um, to do this in your classroom, whether you want it to be an individual assignment where you ask each child to maybe bring in a tissue box. Um, it could even be a cereal box if that's what they had because you can always cut the cereal box and make it a little deeper if you need to. No need to buy anything. Use recycled materials that you have um, around the house. And um, you, if you wanted to make it a small group assignment of four or five kids, maybe they bring in a shoe box for the group. And then if you wanted to make it a large group assignment for the classroom, maybe you use one of those big Amazon boxes and they can decorate them with just brown construction paper if they want to, to make it look like it's covered in bison on the outside. But some of the materials we showed you today are pretty easy to find like this, right? Um, you can find cloth. You have that, you wear clothing every day, I hope. <laughs> and in your closet, you're going to have clothing that you don't wear that just hangs there, right? So um, piece of cloth, um, other things um, that you may have around your house, or you can find at a thrift store. Thrift stores are awesome. We love them. We go and we pilfer all the time through thrift stores to buy items for our touch objects. Iron skillet, um, bead, the, uh, the little bead hanks are actually seed beads. They're, they're glass metal beads. You can find those at Hobby Lobby, Joann's, um, Michael's. They're really easy online, Amazon. Inexpensive for you to buy as well if you want. Um, so think about some items you can include in your touch boxes, even the furs, the animal furs. And again, you may not want to do that. It's up to you. If you don't want to include the animal furs, don't. But if you do, they're pretty inexpensive. This beaver fur you can find for uh, a good quality one for under $30. And the rabbit furs are, are really inexpensive too. But that's totally your choice to include those or not. Those are definitely um, sensory items for sure. Um, and also it, that sense of smell. But uh, you can put other things in the box. It's not always a good sense of smell, especially with the bison box. But <laughs> um, you could even put things in there like coffee. Uh, if you, you know, if you wanted to create a touch box about cattle drives, you could put cowboy gear in there, a rope, a hat, um, uh, coffee, um, beef jerky, things like that. Yeah. And, you know, they could even taste the beef jerky if you wanted to give them that sensory experience. So those are some things to keep in mind, too, that you can easily build in the classroom. And I think Angie mentioned in the last session, too, that you could do a grade level box that could travel like a traveling trunk that could go. Um, throughout your grade level that you could all share so you could pull your resources together. And, and y'all, I'm just going to tell y'all, grandparents, grandpa I was thinking parents could, could donate to this, but you let grandparents know about this, they get all jazzed about this kind of stuff. <laughs> they will, uh, they love this. 
you know, the grands, the grands love this. So you let them know what you need. They will, they will get it for you. These, uh, these sweet little um, precious um, older people have the beads. They might have like the, they might have it in their own house. And exactly. There's lots of stuff they may already have. And what would be cool is that they have like an older version of it too. Mm -hmm. That would be neat. Mm -hmm. So just pitching that out. Yeah. Mercia, do you want to talk about how they can recreate the trading game? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if, you, if you're looking at our slideshow and if you remember the cards that Patty held up for you, um, so we designed those just using Publisher. You could also use Word and Clip Art um, uh, to, to make those cards. We printed them out on card stock and we, we did have them laminated. If you have access to the laminating machine, um, that of course makes them durable. But you could also turn this into um, an art lesson with the kids and they could create their own uh, trading cards. You could just give them simple note cards. They could draw the pictures themselves and then play the trading game together. Um, we used to, before we got our nice fancy blankets, we got a grant last year and that allowed us to update our props a little bit, but we used to use these uh, big pieces of cardboard for our blankets that we had painted and in some cases just taped on geometric designs. So that could also be an art project where they create their own blanket or a large piece of paper to trade on. Um, and the dice, they were just foam dice that we got from Oriental Trading Company, very inexpensive for a, a large quantity and they're very durable. You know, if kids start throwing them across your classroom, they aren't gonna break anything. So very easy, I think, to recreate in a classroom. Right, Patty? Yeah, definitely. And I just got, um someone in the chat window, Michelle asked about where to get the furs and I typed back and said, you can email me at Patty D at Booth Museum or Mersia M at boothmuseum.org and we can give you some resources. I think Crazy Crow was one of them, but we found a couple of others um, in our research too um, out West that um, are traditional um, furriers and um, traditional more traditional shops that have a lot of the different types of furs if you choose um, choose those and they also there's some cool stuff out there too like animal prints but they're made out of resin so they're you know there's no harm to the animal done it's just um uh, like a hoof of an animal but it's it's resin mm -hmm. so if you want those those are kind of fun to have as well tactile objects but you can also use those to like um create molds or to press into things like play-doh or clay and create imprints or sand uh you know, if you have a box with some sand in it and they can press those prints into the sand and create the animal prints, the animals of the West that they may have found, you know, a beaver print or whatever it may be. So um, those are pretty inexpensive. I think they run about $9 um, per resin piece. Um, so if you just had a couple of those and you all kind of pitched in together, um, those are some fun things. So we do have those kind of resources um, we can refer you to. So again, just shoot us an email. We're happy to, um, uh, to help you with that. Um, let's see. I think now it's time for us, Angie. Is it time for us to go into the breakout rooms? Yes. Okay. So um, you could just, it, you have the breakout room box. Okay. So okay. So I'm going to put um, on the Nearpod. I mean, yeah. Okay. I put, it, I put it up on Nearpod, but you'll put it up on your screen as well. Okay. So I'm going to put, um, you, I'm going to go ahead and put everyone in breakout rooms, but what you're seeing here is that we have three questions for you to go into the breakout rooms, okay? We want you to take the three uh, paintings that we uh, discussed with you today, and we want you to select one of those and discuss how you can incorporate economics into your lessons with that piece, um, how you can make the lessons interdisciplinary, um, and um, how you can make them more interactive. So we've talked about that a lot today, but brainstorm a little bit in your group, a little more on that, especially the interdisciplinary nature, because we take a very holistic approach at the museum when we're teaching. It's not just social studies or econ, but it's art and it's language arts and it's all of those things to bring it around full circle um, and to get the most um, out of that learning experience. So just kind of play around with those ideas and how long do we have for the, yeah, um, Angie. We're already at um, 3.58, so we're a little okay. like cutting it short, but I'm, I'm thinking we could do five minutes, even if they just pick okay. one, if they can all pick one to do that, I mean, at least they get the practice of it. Okay. Um, and then if, of course, we have the after parties, so if they want to hang out and talk some more about it, they're more than welcome. I just don't want to hold everybody up and for us to do our survey and all that jazz, so. 
All righty, we're going into breakout rooms now. You guys have five minutes and then we'll be back. Excuse me. Yes. How do you go into the breakout room? You should, You it should pop up saying the Oh, host. okay, I see it, I'm sorry, thank, thank you. you. Oh, that's all right, I just got and my- Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that mean I'm happy. Oh, did y'all hear me? Yeah, y'all didn't hear a word I said. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I thought you were probably answering something like on your email or talking to someone coming in the ring. Oh no, I was. 
I was looking, I looked down, I said, oh, wait a second, I am muted. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put I'm gonna put it back once everybody gets back from the breakout room. I'm gonna share the um the survey link and then we'll do our wrap up and this has been fabulous. It's been fun. Mm-hmm. Why do it if it's not gonna be fun, right? That's right. What's the point? Look, if I if I'm not enjoying it, the kids will not enjoy it. It's even more fun when they're in the museum. <laughs> yeah, that is a fact. That is a fact. Oh, thank you for saying that. That is a very, very, we'll definitely share that out in the um, after party. Oh yeah, the after party's gonna be kicking. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Okay guys, I'm putting in, um, I'll do it a few times just as you're coming in. Um, as you're coming in from the breakout rooms, I'm putting in there the uh, survey for for this workshop. Uh, if you would pretty, pretty please um, fill that out. It takes less than three minutes to do it. Um, basically, you're just telling my boss um, what you got out of this and letting them know, hey, we need to do more of this. And he'll be all about it. Um, I've already got, in, I'm scheming and planning and plotting and scheming um, some uh, very, um specific um meeting so um i'm going to use a couple of minutes just tell you how we're going to wrap this up and then i'm going to pass uh, then um we're going to turn it back over to you patty so that you can um wrap up about uh you can talk to um to everybody that wants to stay about the um fabulous booth museum and when i tell y'all fabulous i don't let me just say i'm not even messing around i booth, booth museum <laughs> mind blower okay it is so fabulous okay so um yes everything that we have um you're going to get access if it if you saw it on the screen you're going to have access to it um it well well i take that back except for the furs and the hides the things <laughs> if it wasn't under the document camera you'll have access to it um but even the furs and the hides um patty and mercia are going to gather together some some suggested vendor links for you and the, they'll be super glad to send those to you when i um when i send you the link to all the resources i'm also going to include their uh their contact information so that you can just email them and if there's something like hey i really need a beaver hide where where's the best place i can get that they, they can recommend that to you because um i can't i, I don't know what it is um i can google it but that's not that's not a sure bet um anyway so i am so excited i'm um i'm putting it in there one more time the survey um just to let you know guys um we are i have a um the biggest request i've gotten um based on the feedback that i've gotten from all these um uh, virtual workshops is uh just very concentrated in in one or two uh grade levels so we're on i've already planned i've already got a special guest um my friend jennifer zumbera is with the georgia doe she and i are going to team up together to do a k1 econ workshop uh virtual workshop on cinco de mayo that would be may 5th and then next week um and i'll let y'all know about this before the end of the day um there's going to be um uh okay there's going to be a two three workshop and a four five workshop so that way we can concentrate more on your needs and and things that that you need to teach uh virtually and also how you can be effective in your classroom as well uh, hopefully we can merge the two so anyway that's that's what i have and i'm going to turn it back over to you my friend Let me unmute myself. All right. Well, this is this is the after party <laughs> for anyone who has questions um, about the booth. Marcia and I are here. Um, we love working with teachers. We love working with your students. Um, that's the heart of our education department um, by far. So if you haven't physically come to the booth before, we encourage you to do those field trips because it is uh, we actually have the largest permanent collection of Western art on exhibition in the entire United States. Um, this is a unique resource that is in the south and the southeast, really east of the Mississippi that a lot of people just don't know about. And it's right here in Cartersville. And um, in addition to having the largest um, 
exhibition of Western art on permanent exhibition in our 120,000 square foot facility, we also have a presidential gallery uh, full of primary sources of letters, uh, signed written letters by every single president of the United States. Those are paired with black and white photos. We have peace medals. We have um, campaign um, buttons uh, and different things like that as well in our presidential gallery. Uh, we also have a uh, collection of Civil War art. Uh, we have a Civil War program that we um, teach with the Bartow History Museum. It's a collaborative program. We have a couple of collaborative programs where you can get two museums at the price of one. And Civil War Union Dissolved is one in which we collaborate with the Bartow History Museum. Um, it's a great program. And our second grade program, Cherokee Cultures, um, East to West is also a collaboration with the History Museum. And for that one, they actually physically go to both museums because it's literally across our sidewalk as our sister museum. Um, when you apply for our Booth Public School Transportation Fund, that, um, that's available for any public school. It's not just Title I because there are some schools that fall through the cracks on that. I'm going to see Zoom meeting and they will not stop. Um, and I'm trying to see. Uh, do you have the mute button there, Angie? Uh, you do. I do. <laughs> okay. If you go to participants, yeah. down on the bottom, participants. Oh, and all. Yeah, mute all. All right. Okay, got it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys. Everyone's muted. Um, but. Uh, Patty, I saw a question somebody asked about uh, activities, tour programs for, um, let's see, it looked like pre-K through kindergarten. Is that right? Yeah, it looks and, like and it through just came in that I just saw, will you have any resources, activities, tours available catering to pre-K, K or first? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, Mersha, do you want to talk to them a little bit about, in fact, I can take us to our website and Mersha, while I'm doing that, do you want to talk to them about those resources and those programs? Absolutely. So uh, remember, we're still building our teacher resources. So um, I would say that pre-K and kindergarten, first grade, those are still some areas that we need to build our teacher resources in. But for tour programs, we do have tour programs for that age group. Uh, so our first tour program would be my first visit. And that's, uh, we suggest that for pre-K, although kindergarten is more than welcome to join us. Um, and that is just kind of an introduction to being in a museum setting, sitting and listening while um, a docent talks about the artwork, but there's also a lot of interaction. They actually have um, an opportunity to sit around um, a little campfire uh, with a campfire in the background and we uh, play little ukuleles and uh, sing um, a, a traditional cattle call song and yodel. It's a lot of fun <laughs> and they, they make a cowboy hat. And so that's a great introduction to, you know, going and visiting a museum and then um, some of the basic concepts behind Western art and uh, uh, um, Western culture. Uh, then we also have our action and art program and that is an ELA program for first grade and it's looking at some of the very basic concepts um, from ELA first grade standards um, but it's also looking at um, building parts and pieces of sentences and stories and it's also looking at um, fiction versus nonfiction test text and we compare that to art. Uh, so we'll compare a textbook to a realistic work of art and we'll compare a storybook to a more illustrative, more fantasy looking piece of art. And so they're able to really look at those differences and um, really discuss those together as a group with their docent. And I'm seeing Marja something I'm gonna respond to about virtual field trips. Um, yes, they're coming. Um, that is something uh, that we are in, uh, we're working on the Westward Ho, the Westward Expansion Program, which we were highlighting for you today, and our American Indian Cultures and Contributions Program. That's also, both of those will be available in the fall to schools that cannot physically come to us. Um, if you live really far away, if you're in one of those Southern Georgia counties or you're just too far to do a field trip, um, we can provide a virtual field trip for you. If you're close enough to come, we want you to come. 
we want you to physically come in the building because that's an entirely different experience. Um, and we, we do have transportation money that can help uh, to cover the cost of the buses for you. It covers the mileage and uh, um, the driver fee. And right now we're covering a minimum of 50% of that cost. And I have a little bit more money because we had some very gracious donors um, and a great fundraiser um, this past year. We may be able to up that percentage some this year. So we're working on that now. Uh, our program fees are also really low cost. They range anywhere between five to seven dollars. Um, so they're very reasonable. And then the tr with the transportation fee, it covers public buses only, public school buses. So it doesn't cover charter buses. Um, but I can give you what I would normally give a public school bus. Um, that cost, I can put it towards your charter bus. Um, and it's really easy. If you go to our website, which you see I have pulled up here, if you go under the learn tab, that's where you're going to find um, schools, which is what you're, we have here. And um, if you click, you can um, come down and you can see booking your field trip is as easy as one, two, three, four. And we have that here. Okay. And um, we have selecting your program. Uh, first planning your trip, selecting your program, then we have the reservation form, and then the public school transportation form, which is a simple one pager. Easy, come straight to me, um, and I'll send you back confirmation, um, usually within the week, okay? So that's a great place to go. Uh, to take a look at programs, you just click on select your programs. We have a flip book that you can download as well that, um, this is for last year. Our new one is coming out very soon. It will be up for the upcoming year. Uh, we have a great event. I did want to highlight. Uh, it's an outdoor event. It's a festival. It lasts four days, but two days are solely devoted to school groups. It's called Passport to the West, and usually it's sold out. You can see last year it sold out. Um, if it rains, we have a rain backup plan. We move everything inside, so no worries there, but we have um, Jim Sawgrass, uh, um, come up uh, with his son, Cody Boatner, who is the world uh, hoop dancing champion from the Herd Museum out in Arizona. They do a great uh, presentation on um, the indigenous cultures focus on the Eastern Woodland culture, but he also has um, a friend that comes representing um, a Plains tribe. And so it's an East and West look at those cultures. Uh, lots of artifacts, lots of um, engagement for the students. We also have Pioneer Station set up thanks to our booth, um, sorry, to our Bartow History Museum partner. Um, we have um, a soap maker, we have a spinner, we have um, a potter, we have all sorts of wonderful stations set up outside uh, for this experience. Um, if you're not into being outdoors with lots of your kids and keeping control of small groups and rotating them yourself, because it is self-led, um, you would probably want to lean more towards our guided tours that have docents to lead you through the museum, okay? So it just depends on your preference. Some schools really love that outdoor festival. They like the freedom of it. Other teachers do not. They want to they wanna know where they're going to go at what time, and, and that's fine. We have both of those available for you, um, a guided tour or you could come for our, um, our weekend adventure. It's the fourth weekend in October every year, okay? Um, again, virtual field trips for those schools that can't get to us, starting with our Westward Ho for fourth and fifth grades and our American Indians Cultures and Contributions for third grades, which, have our two, which are our two most popular programs. And just to note, yeah, go ahead, Mersha. Someone asking, um, I think for Passport to the West, if second grade would be included in that. And yes. I, I second, it, it would hit some second grade standards because again, we are looking at Eastern Woodland Indian cultures. They do compare them to Western American Indian cultures, but they do focus a lot on Eastern American Indian cultures as well. And they have um, two, uh, they have different camps set up that illustrate the lifestyles between those two different cultures. So um, excellent question, but yes, that would hit some second grade standards. And then we do often have older kids come for that as well um, uh, to see um, mm -hmm. just kind of reinforcing standards, um, but also um, it hits some middle school standards as well. So um, it's kind of across the board, although I think we do market it more for third through fifth grade, you do hit some other standards across mm -hmm. our uh, curriculum. 
Yeah, we usually do get quite a few, at least a, a couple of two or three, at least I think second grade classes that usually do come. They seem to enjoy it. Um, but it is it is a fun time. We really we really have a good time with it. I pulled up our programs just for you to see again. Our Cherokee cultures east to west grade two, our American Indians cultures and contributions grades uh, grade three. Um, the American Indian experience is an eighth grade program, which we've really just booked with our local school. But it is open for booking. But that involves the Etowah Indian mounds too. It's a full day experience. So they come to us. Um, you would only get transportation funds to come to us, so we can't cover anything with the Indian mounds because that's part of um, the park service. Um, you also have to pay your separate entrance fee to them as well, but the day is designed so that you come to the Booth Museum, you go to the Bartow History Museum, and then you have lunch on our premise, premises, and then you get on your bus and you go to the Etowah Indian mounds to finish out your day. So for a, a well-rounded experience, that is in place for eighth graders um, and it, it really is a really cool partnership. Um, Westward Ho for fourth and fifth graders by far. If you want to learn about Westward Expansion and you haven't been to our museum and seen our artwork, you need to, you need to get, um, yeah. get there with your students because uh, it is so much fun. We have so much fun with it. Um, the Civil War Union Dissolve Program. Um, we worked really hard on revising this one recently. Um, this is another great program. We've gotten really great evaluations from teachers. We tweak our programs every year based on teacher feedback. So just know that we're listening to you and we make changes. Um, if we're hearing it from majority of the, of the teachers, we're gonna go and into those programs and make those changes so that they meet your needs. We have a Presidents and Heroes Program. This one is actually um, undergoing some revisions this year. Um, of course, visual arts, we always have um, all of our uh, galleries um, can be toured. Um, our Booth Blazers program is, has an arts, strong arts focus, but it's really a mini highlight tour of the museum. And even though you're learning about principles of design and elements of art, you're also learning about artists, mm -hmm. um, American Indian artists, or um, our Western artists, females, males, um, you name it, you're, you're learning all of that in the process of going through this along with the history of it all. So even though that's heavily arts based, it's a great highlights tour. Uh, Mersha mentioned the My First Visit for the Pre-K and K. Super fun, super cute little kids playing their little ukuleles around the little campfire. It is the cutest thing ever. Uh, they have so much fun and they are learning. Okay, all of our programs are about learning, uh, having fun learning. Our STEAM program, we love it. We have, let me tell you, this is a program that we have had many iterations of, and we finally feel like we got it as far as um, what's going to work the best with our collection and meet the teacher's needs. So we're really excited about this. This is one program we're hoping to really premiere and push this year. Um, we wanted to run it last year and get a lot of teacher feedback from it, and they've given us that good, housing, good housekeeping seal of approval. So we're really going to be pushing that heavily. Um, super, super fun program. Um, Mersha, do you want to tell them just a little bit about the STEAM program? Absolutely. So, um, so the STEAM program is half in our museum galleries and then half a workshop for students. So we have two stagecoaches in our collection. We have a mud wagon and then we, and then we have a Concord uh, stagecoach um, from uh, built by the Abbott and Downing Company, but formerly owned by three different stagecoach companies, including Wells Fargo. Um, and that lets us talk about not only how technology has changed, but how travel communication has changed uh, throughout westward expansion. And then we come back into the workshop portion of the of, of the tour, and students actually build their own stage stagecoach. Um, and they, of course, build it out of you know cardstock, popsicle sticks, uh, chopsticks. Um, and uh, we have little round coasters that they use for wheels. And, um, but they're actually putting all that together and the goal is to have a stagecoach that rolls. But they're having to use teamwork and they're having to use critical thinking skills in order to put those uh, pieces together and to build uh, a, a, working, a working stagecoach. Yeah, so super fun program. Um, language arts literacy, visual literacy, huge for us being an art museum. Um, DOE does recognize paintings and um, artwork as a form of text. Absolutely. Um, we have so much fun with the action and art program for first grade. 
our literacy-based program. Um, this was actually a reward for all of the Bartow County School this year to be able to come to do this field trip with us um, after their literacy challenge and learning their sight words. So um, this is a great program um, for students to come. And you can see that we're looking at um, uh, dis discussing like information text versus story text. And we're using paintings to do that so that the, the first graders really understand it. Uh, it's a great way to do it. Um, and it also includes a visit to our interactive play space, Sagebrush Ranch, you don't wanna miss that. Um, Wild Ride is a super popular second grade program. Uh, it's, it does hit second and third grade standards or supports second and third grade standards, I should say. Um, and there we're looking at folk tales um, and fables. And we also have several Cherokee folk tales and fables included in that. So that's great for second grade. And Story Detectives is an awesome program. It's so much fun to lead. It's for fourth and fifth graders, but it's exploring character settings and plots, and it's doing that through the paintings in the museum. So it's, it's fun um, to engage the students with, with those characters and the paintings and what do they think is going on in this, you know, in, uh, in this painting, it's dark and there's a horse coming. And um, so they come up with some great stories, but they're using, um, again, uh, these, these guiding rules of um, discussing setting and plot and characters, these that, that we give them in their groups. Uh, inference, analysis, um, all of that prediction, they're using all of those skills, uh, but, it's, but they're creating stories as they go along with the artwork. So that's kind of a highlight of all the different programs that we have to offer um, teachers. We welcome you at any time. Marcia and I love to tour teachers around the museum. Um, if you want to bring your group in, if you need to convince your principal or your um, department head or whoever um, authorized your field trips that it's worth it, just bring them in because that will flip them around like that. If they're not sure and they don't understand art and they don't get it, just bring them in. We'll take care of the rest of it because once they come in the doors, there has not been a single time that we have not had them leave over the moon and field trips come from those schools. Um, it just, it's a matter of, of uh, getting them in the doors to really see, to really understand. And we can walk you through every single station. We take the students through and explain the pedagogy behind it and lead you through it. Um, and the same with your administrators. So just let us know if you're ever interested in that. We're happy, happy to do that. So I think that's pretty much everything. Yes. I'm so, I'm just telling you, I've, I've been, I'll admit, look, people who've been to my, my professional development sessions know I don't hide anything. It is what it is. And I'm, I'm here looking at some of the feedback from the surveys and whoa. <laughs> this is this one, I, I got a special, I got to share this one. And those of you who are still hanging out with us, you, you get to be the in crowd that gets to hear this. Um, it says, wait, let me scroll it down because I thought it was great. It needs to be on a t-shirt. Uh, the ladies were a gift for educators from God. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> you are a gift from God, ladies. Yes. <laughs> yes. It, 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 I think everybody that attended, that it, they really got a lot out of. And just like I, I shared in an email to everybody before before they came, I said, I just want you to know that, you know, this is really geared more. I mean, I know it said K-5, but really it's more 3-5. That was my mistake. Um, but, but a good teacher can take the strategies because strategies are just good teaching. And you can take the strategies and for the, the VTS or, um, or, or make it a, a touch box. You can use that with any grade level. I mean, I'm thinking about kindergarten. You can mm -hmm. make a box with currency, mm -hmm. the symbols, um, different things that represent the different community workers that are labeled in there. There's so many different things you can do. And these ladies have shown y'all today um, just a, a little bit of what you can do in your classroom to make it, I'm just going to say it, it, to make your class an experience and not just, just a, a, a place to go. So your, your, your classroom should be an experience and not just a place to get information because they can get information from Google. Right? Right. And I think that's it, ladies. Um, 
Patty and Marcia, if y'all if y'all want to call me in just a couple of minutes and we'll debrief on this one too. Um, but the rest of you friends, oh my gosh. Oh wait, Patty, you're gonna have to call, you're gonna have to close us out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you want me to stop sharing? Do you want me to give it back to you? Oh yeah, yeah, give it back to me. That way I can um I can there you go. There we go. So I'm gonna um all right. So oh one new message. Okay. Oh yes, yes, prudence very very it's a was a fabulous program so yeah Patty, yay. thank y'all dream team <laughs> absolutely we thank you so much thank you teachers for your time uh, thanks angie for allowing us to do this and oh, um my joy. you know we we hope to we hope to see you guys again soon come on into the museum and ladies um and gentlemen who are still with us um be looking in your email box for um invitations for me to register for additional stuff and also i'll be giving you all the information from patty and marcia as well cool y'all have a great rest of your day and um i'll see you next time bye guys bye everyone bye